Welcome to the Science Salon Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. This week's guest is Robert Pennock. His new book is An Instinct for Truth, Curiosity and the Moral Character of Science. Love the Vermeer cover. Robert is Professor of History, Philosophy, and Sociology of Science at Michigan State University in the Lyman Briggs College and the Departments of Philosophy and Computer Engineering, Computer Science and Engineering. He's the author of Tower of Babel, The Evidence Against the New Creationism, which he published in 1999. He spoke for me at Caltech back then, uh, so I was glad to see him back on the uh, book circuit. Uh, his book is really interesting about um, the virtues of skepticism in science, which, of course, I liked, uh, and what it means to be a scientist in, in a virtuous way. And so we dig into all that, including how science works, the nature of anomalies, when paradigms shift, why outsiders can make contributions of science, by, but why they usually don't, uh, why that kind of scientific training does make a difference. It's not an elitism thing. It's just kind of a, a learned virtue and skills. Uh, we get into, of course, creationism and all some of the hot button issues today, like uh, race and IQ or gender differences and evolutionary psychology. Anyway, all that in the context of how science operates and when it, when and when it's not heavily influenced by culture and politics. And uh, we do end up talking about, at the end, the, my, my uh, pet project of the is ought fallacy, the naturalistic fallacy, or, or going from is to ought. And he really comes up with some great um, explication and further development of what I'm trying to do with these examples that I, I read to him from a couple of papers I published on this. Anyway, then we end up talking uh, at the end about, um, cause his lab uh, works with, uh, self drive, the artificial intelligence of self-driving cars and the ethics of that, you know, the trolley problem of does the self-driving car mow down the three people on the sidewalk or the two people in the crosswalk or kill the passengers in the backseat or whatever. And it's pretty, pretty interesting ethical dilemmas there that he and his lab are working on. A note on support. Um, we do appreciate your support. More and more of you are, are kicking in a little bit. We could use a little more support. Uh, again, the the support is for the Skeptic Society, a 501c3 nonprofit um, science organization. The money doesn't go to me personally. I have a monthly paycheck from the society as the director. So uh, what I'm trying to do is raise money to further support um, what it costs to produce. You know, we have a new studio here now that we're renting and uh, I pay people, sound engineers, and other people to work on this and uh, make it all available, as well as our other projects. Um, so to the extent you can provide some funding, it's deeply appreciated. I've noticed since I got into the podcast business that uh, there's very much a Pareto distribution here. I don't know if you know Ilfred Pareto's discovery um, of, this was the distribution of wealth. It was something like you know, 80% of the wealth is owned by 20% of the people. And there's lots of examples of this, you know, like 80% of the points scored in the NBA are scored by 20% of the players, um, you know, distribution of words in the English language. But in this case, in the podcast business, it's probably 95-5, like 5% of podcasters get 95% of the financial support. It, it's really quite lopsided. Um, I'm not part of that 5%. I'm part of the 95%. A lot of good podcasters out there. It's great. If you like the show, if you get some value out of it, we do do this every week. I actually read the books of my guests. Most people don't do that. I actually do that. Some some do, but most don't. Uh, so to that extent, you know, we could really use your support. Whatever you can do is greatly appreciated. So with that, thank you again for your support and welcome to Robert Pennock. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Sure thing. The new book. Congratulations. An Instinct for Truth, Curiosity and the Moral Character of Science. I love that cover. Of course, that's a classic image. Uh, from Vermeer. From Vermeer. Yeah, that's right. And uh, it's a nice sequel. I, I think of it as something of a sequel to your your previous book, The um, Tower of Babel, The Evidence Against New Creationism, in as much as you were one of the first to really tackle the intelligent design movement or their theory or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, we had all seen their... Uh, the demise of of um, scientific creationism with the Louisiana creationism case that went to the Supreme Court. Right. They, they lost seven to two. That was 1987. 
1988 and so on. I've, so I kind of figured that was the death of the creationist movement, uh, <laughs> at least from the top down. But as you showed, um, you know, I forget when that book was published, like 96, 95 or something like that. Yeah, that was 99. In fact, I think that's the first time that we met because you invited me out for the Caltech uh, right. talk that's, in that, that's right. That's right. Yeah. I spoke about their web strategy, uh, the wedge. Uh, yes, that's right. At that time. Right. Yeah, so they they kind of they, they, the the movement kind of evolves ironically since they don't believe in evolution. There's sort of a natural selection of their strategies, and in that case, they they shifted to uh, as Bill Bill Dembski described it as you know, a much more sophisticated uh, approach than the kind of yahoos from decades past that were sort of embarrassing. So they they took that more academic approach, but still, as you showed and others, uh, that you know, it, it isn't just that they're doing bad science and, and so that, this gets us into your new book uh that, that we could talk about the virtues of science it isn't as you noted at the beginning of of an instinct for truth that s scientists weren't upset about the uh intelligent design creationists because they they made mistakes in their science it's that they're not doing science or even worse there's something immoral about what they're doing it's it's sort of anti-science yeah this is the thing that kind of struck me as i was doing the research for that book and and noting the way that scientists were reacting to uh, the intelligent design creationists. Um, often people will, will say, oh, well, you know, this is just this is just bad science. Um, but there's a lot of things that scientists get wrong or something that's bad science, and you don't react to them in the way that scientists reacted to creationists. Um, it, it, it just seemed to me in looking at the way that scientists were were reacting that they were offended by this. Uh, they 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 saw this as a as a violation, really, of scientific integrity. That there was a there was a moral um, aspect to their rejection of it. That this was this was counterfeit science. That this was somehow a wrong what they were doing. And 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 that's I think as a much stronger and, and much more interesting um, uh, kind of reaction. And that's kind of what got me going to thinking about well, what is this moral character that's that's underneath. Uh, that type of reaction, um, because my my claim is that there is an unarticulated sometimes set of values that make science what it is. And in certain places, in certain times, you see it emerge. And that this was one of those times. Yeah. And it's different than, say, the cold fusion debacle, which was, uh, you know, Pons and Fleischmann, two real scientists. And exactly. they kind of just made a mistake of holding the press conference to announce uh, free energy too cheap to meter. Uh, before they actually had it corroborated. But that exactly. was just, well, Gary Tubbs called, I think it was Gary Tubbs who wrote that book, Bad Science. Uh, but what these guys are doing is not even bad science. Right. It, it was it was something that was pretending to be science, uh, but wasn't science uh, a, at all. And it, I think it's the pretense and the fact that it was making itself out to be something that it wasn't. And in doing so, really undermining what it meant to be a scientist, what what it means to be to have integrity as a scientist. Uh, that's the thing I think that really uh, scientists objected to. It just it just wasn't science. Right. And no, and neither is it um, the confirmation bias that all of us are subject to, where, of course, scientists being people want their pet theories to be true. And they, they hope that they're not falsified and they hope they accumulate evidence in support of it. And maybe they're a little biased in that regard. And science has its mechanisms in place to, to try to avert that problem. Creationists are not even subject to confirmation bias. It's still something different still. Yeah, I think that this is actually one of the things that's pretty distinctive about what scientific method does. Uh, it recognizes that, you know, we're all human beings uh, and we may have our preferences. You, you kind of hope that your hypothesis is going to turn out to be true. But the real thing that you want is to find out what really is true, uh, and you put into place methods uh, to essentially rein yourself in um, to make sure that your uh, prejudices and biases don't infect what you really hope to have happen, which is to find out what the fact of the matter is. Yeah, so, so I think it's just being a method of, of bias control, really. Right. So that's this is where this idea for um, virtue, the, the kind of the the virtue of curiosity, the virtue of honesty. You have those great quotes from Feynman. I've used those quotes too, that sort of bending over backwards to try to be honest and try to tell all the things you did in your experiment and where you could be wrong and so on. 
that, that, that that was at a Caltech uh, commencement uh, right, speech that right, gave. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I was going to look that up and read part of that because that was just so good. Uh, let's see. Um, and, and also, one of the heroes to your story is is Darwin, which I thought was very appropriate. His you know, sort of dog it is as does it. And, you know, you just kind of grind away and work at trying to figure out what the problem is. All right, let me see. Well, the, what... the, the title for the book itself comes from uh, a quote from Darwin that I uh, really make use of in, in um, the first chapter, especially, but really throughout the book with this notion that he sees within himself, he says, an instinct for truth, knowledge or discovery that's not unlike the virtue uh, the instinct for, for virtue. Um, and and that notion there of uh, a way of thinking, a characteristic way of thinking that has its roots in instinctual um, evolutionary um, benefits that it gives, but then made more precise by by science itself. So that's that's what it's after. Yeah. Do you, do you th- well, let me read that that quote and then we'll go back to that. That quote from Feynman from his uh, commencement speech. Uh, for example, if you're doing an experiment, you should report everything that you think might make it invalid. Not only what you think is right about it, other causes that could possibly explain your results and things you thought of that you've eliminated by some other experiment and how they worked to make sure the other fellow can tell that they have been eliminated. In summary, the idea is to try to give all the information to help others to judge the value of your contribution, not just the information that leads to judgment in one particular direction or the other. Beautifully said. Yeah. This this is this is Feynman essentially speaking to uh, uh, students who have just completed their undergraduate degrees. Right. This is a, a, a commencement address. Uh, the the interesting thing about a commencement address is you sort of think of it as the end of your studies, but really it's the beginning right. of right. the beginning of your your time now as someone who is going to be not a student any longer, but now someone who's going in to be the thing. And that's one of the times I think when we have the opportunity and and people take advantage of the opportunity to say something about the values that underlie that thing that you're going into. Right. Uh, And, and that's what Feynman was doing there. You know, he was saying, you know, here's what it means to me to be a scientist. Uh, It, it, it means having uh, this attitude about uh, what we want, to find out and how to do it and to make sure that we don't do it in a way that undermines what we really hope to achieve, um, which is to say, doing it uh, honestly, right, so that we're letting the evidence decide our conclusions rather than what we might hope would be uh, the conclusion. Uh, and he, he ends that by, by saying, you know, that he, he knows that there are challenges and constraints and pressures that students might face as they enter into the, that vocation. There'll be times when that might be hard to do. But he says, I hope that you wind up finding yourself in a place where you have that freedom to be able to pursue things in that honest way, because that's what science is all about. Yeah, he concludes. So I have just one wish for you. You can imagine standing up there at the podium. So I have just one wish for you, the good luck to be somewhere where you are free to maintain the kind of integrity I have described and where you do not feel forced uh, uh, by a need to maintain your position, in the organization or financial support or so on to lose your integrity. May you have that freedom. Yeah. So, uh, but let's, let's go back to this instinct for truth. You know, there's um, a couple of thinkers these days, Donald Hoffman has uh, Donald Hoffman has a new book out, The Case Against Reality. I had him on the podcast. And another guy, Anil Seth, S E T H, he has a very popular um, uh, TED talk on this that we don't really know reality. Our that evolution did not design our senses to construct a accurate veridical model of the world. It's designed to just get our genes into the next generation. And then, of course, they they rattle through all the illusions that we're fooled by and and so on, and how, how easy it is we're fooled. So I don't know how much of you followed that, you know, sort of correspondence theory of truth versus, you know, other theories of truth versus these challenges to those that we don't really know reality. And this is aside from quantum physics and all the weirdness that goes on there. This is just like you and I looking at three-dimensional objects at the macro scale. We, we are not accurately uh, really interpreting the world. What do you think about that? It, it's, it's interesting that they're kind of, uh, giving a, a version of something that one of the intelligent design 
creationist Alvin Plantinga mm. had given. He he called it Darwin's doubt, right? It's mm. it's you know how can we, uh, as descendants of 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 monkeys, um, um, uh, expect uh, that we're knowing knowing the world, right? What is it about that uh, that could give us any confidence in this? Um, uh, so so I didn't think that it was a great argument from uh, Plantinga, and and I don't really buy in into the extreme version uh, in these two versions either. Um, and, and really, it mostly, I think, has to do with with an inflated notion of what we expect truth to be. Yeah. Right? If, if you think that that what we're after is some sort of absolute truth uh, and you think that that's what truth means, uh, then that's exactly right. Okay? Clearly, we don't have um, that notion. Our, our mental capabilities uh, and evolution wouldn't have produced something of that sort. But. What it does do, and I think that this is this is the reason we can believe uh, our senses, at least to some degree, is that uh, it gives us a notion of good enough of a fit to the environment. That's what adapt- adaptations are, after all. Um, and if we didn't have something that was close enough, that's to say that our models were good enough, then it's it's unclear how we would survive and reproduce. So the notion of fitness is clearly important and they get that totally right. That's what we're after. Uh, that's what evolution is after, if you think of it anthropomorphically. Um, but that notion comes built in with the way that I think about truth and presented in the book, which is a notion of verisimilitude. As to say, how close are your models to reality? Uh, we don't expect them to be perfect. We don't get truth with a capital T, and I think that's what they're rightly uh, objecting to. Uh, but we do get models that are closer and closer, uh, and they better be, or else we're going to fall off cliffs. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I think well, the point you make it's it's truth with a small t, not a capital T. Uh, you know, we're not after religious or political truths here. Uh, we're doing something different, and, and to get out of that binary thinking, it, it's a scale. And, you know, some uh, hypotheses and theories are, are closer to the truth. Others are further away, again, with a small t. As defined by some criteria, we have to have some criteria by which we decide how close we are. Uh, Steve Pinker makes this point in, in uh, our new co- cover story of the new issue. of uh, He addresses this, this claim that we're living in a post-truth world. You know, basically ever since Trump and fake news and all that stuff. And so Steve opens up by saying... Is the statement we're living in a post-truth world true? <laughs> so the moment you ask the question, if you have an opinion, then you, you're obviously uh, marshalling some arguments and so on. And, and we're not living in a, in a post-truth world. So you open your book by talking about uh, not just creationists, but, but postmodernists. And these are liberal academics who are committed, allegedly, to science and reason. And yet they have this idea that well, there is no ultimate truth, therefore science is just another story. So talk a little bit about the science wars of the 90s and, and where it's gone since then, and these kind of challenges to science as a hegemonic narrative designed to keep certain people in power and, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. So I actually started in, in my preface with the, the worry about the post-truth world as well, uh, bringing up... Uh, the way this term was was um, initially coined, I mean, it was the it was the Oxford uh, English Dictionary folks who always come up with their yeah. word of the year, right? The new word of the year, and, and this was the word from just a, a couple of years ago, and and they specifically called out the election in the United States, right, right, uh, and 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 Trump's uh, uh, disdain for. Uh, for truth, but also things that were going on in, in England with, with Brexit at the time, where it seemed as though the political arguments they claimed uh, were no longer tied to reality, uh, and that reality uh, and, and true claims um, made very little difference to political discourse. It was a discounting of truth generally. Uh, and, and that's actually part of what's my goal here, is to say, no, we need to reclaim hmm. uh, truth as being something that's valuable. Um, you talk about uh, the science wars with regard to this, but my small part in, in that really had to do with pointing out how the postmodernist uh, objections to truth and objectivity in science 
uh, were co-opted by the right and specifically by the intelligent design uh, movement. Philip Johnson, who was really the, the godfather of the movement, very explicitly pulled upon that approach um, as a way of trying to undermine evolution. Uh, right. uh, his his initial uh, title for his book, which uh, started the movement, really, uh, was going to be called Darwin Deconstructed. Uh, oh, wow. And, and he pulled from critical legal studies, uh, but essentially applied it to uh, his uh, his attack upon evolution. And so I saw uh, that as uh, an example of the corrosive effect of that approach, um, but now being used on the right rather than the left, right? And it seems to me as though it's a problem on both sides. Uh, yeah. And I, I wound up writing an article uh, that's called the, the Postmodern Sins of Intelligent Design, uh, ah, which right. specifically gave the history of how the movement was based in a postmodern view, uh, showed Philip Johnson's um, argument in those terms. In Tower of Babel, I, I described this as well. Uh, and then used that as an example of how um, it functions as what I would think of as a, as a reductio ad absurdum to the view, right? Because if you take that uh, to its radical extreme, uh, it's um, uh, it's easy to apply it on any side, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. That's exactly what they wound up doing. Uh, they wound up applying it as though there's no fact of the matter. Uh, science is just a narrative. It's just a viewpoint. And his legal strategy was actually intended to make use of that idea that evolution was viewpoint discrimination. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so again, you can deploy this whether you're on the right or left, uh, and it seems to me to be uh, problematic equally in both cases. Yeah, let's steel man the postmodernist argument for just a moment and give them some credit. For example, Steve Gould's book, uh, Mismeasure of Man, is this, you know, history of these, you know, abusive theories, scientific theories of, you know, racial ranking with blacks at the bottom and whites at the top and so on, and how those got misapplied through the eugenics movement and, you know, all the way up to the, say, 1950s or so. Um, that's an example of, you know, science being portrayed as this objective search for, uh, external truths that are really there that was clearly driven by these kind of social, political, cultural trends. Absolutely. Yep. You know, so we have, to, we have to acknowledge that, you know, that kind of narrative is, you know, how do we avoid that kind of problem? That's sort of the biggest. So this is, line. this is one of the things that I think tells us why it is that thinking of science in virtue terms with the idea that what we are is seeking uh, truths of the world uh, gives us a way of criticizing science uh, for just these sorts of lapses, right? You need to have a standard, uh, and I would say it's a, it's a moral standard that connects the epistemology to the ethics. It's a standard to say, this is what we're after as scientists. We know that we have biases uh, and we want to be able to make sure that those uh, don't uh, come in to infect our our work. So let's build methods to make that less likely. We know that people will make use of science for their own purposes, just as they do for anything else. So again, part of what you need to do in those cases is to say, here's a, an example of scientific failure, or, or at least the misuse of science. And part of what that does is actually, I would say, affirm the importance of scientific truth and so on, because then you can point to cases where there's uh, a, a, a sure example of, of the failure of that. Yeah. Um, well, as a, as a more recent example, uh, well, I, I would say even Gould's critics and people that today still think there's something to the racial differences in IQ being largely genetic and, and so on, acknowledge that the abuses that he tracked in his book were, were true and those were wrong. Uh, but still that 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 now we're doing good science or to use a different example, the gender wars now that, you know, evolutionary psychologists tell us that men and women are different, uh, not 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 cognitively so much as in their interests. And this is why, I say, there's more male programmers in Silicon Valley than there are female programmers. You know, the counter narrative to that is that, no, that, you know, that, 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 that the way school systems are set up, women are discouraged from going into STEM classes around eighth grade or so. And that, therefore, it's cultural. So I, I think we're still in the middle of one of these debates that, you know, people pile up the science on each side. 
you know, the, uh, the right says, well, look, the evolutionary psychologists tell us that the, the, there are these, uh, you know, gender based cognitive interest differences in what men and women prefer to do for careers that goes back earlier. And then you have the critics of that on the other side that say, no, it's, it's the way women are raised, girls are raised and culture and so on. I don't know how you want to, how, how do you resolve that? Cause we're in the middle of one of these now, each of which claims to have science on their side. So, so again, the, the thing that I'm interested in here is, is uh, showing why it is that we should think of, of some of these questions, at least as, as things that have a, component that we could investigate empirically uh, and then ask ourselves what's the relationship of things we might find out empirically to what we should do or what we shouldn't do from a moral perspective, right? And I think when you mix those two things up, then it's likely that you're going to get in trouble. Uh, and mm. to take it back to the the initially way that you proposed the question, which was in terms of sort of a postmodern um, view, if you, if you think as as a radical um, social constructivist or a radical postmodernist, that there really isn't anything to truth beyond the narratives of power, um, then it seems to me as though you actually undermine the goal that you have. I mean, clearly, this is a goal that we would share, right? We want to, av we want to avoid injustices, right? We want to avoid um, prejudices. We want to make our, our world better in those sorts of ways. It seems to me that if you start with a position that says, there's nothing uh, factual to be determined except uh, the facts of those who uh, who happen to be in power. You undermine the very basis of being able to challenge those sorts of issues, mm. right? It's to mm. be able to say, no, there really is oppression there. That was that was truly oppression, right? right. This is an example of of a true mis uh, misapplication of science. Of science. So you need, I would say, to dismiss that approach if you're going to have the goals that you want in the first place, which is to be able to rightly identify cases where prejudice or bias or racism or sexism came into play. Yeah. So you have a, you, in your first chapter, you talk about the telos of science. So you, you have a lot of Aristotle in here, which I like. So the telos are, and what is the purpose of a thing? Uh, Jonathan Haidt actually gave a nice lecture on this last year. Uh, he, he's concerned about the kind of postmodern takeover of the universities and the coddling of the American mind and all that stuff. And, and basically he was challenging universities, make a decision. What is your telos truth or justice? Now it seems to me you should, we should be able to have both, but uh, that, that kind of brings me to, well, well what, no. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, universities have always kind of followed the, the telos of science. I think that is, we want to know what's true, at least with a small T. So talk a little bit about from your book about what you think the telos of science is. Right. So uh, just to, to briefly uh, connect those those two points there, it, it certainly ought not to be a, a forced choice. Right. Um, in fact, part of what I was trying to suggest there was that if you're going to have any sorts of judgments about justice and to make claims about whether we're approaching it or not, you'd better have a notion of truth. Uh, because that's going to be something that you're going to be able to use to say, are we getting better or worse with regard to these things? Um, Science, it seems to me, does have something to say about at least certain uh, important uh, aspects of that. The telos of science, which is to say the goal or aim of science, uh, has to do with just figuring out things about the natural world, figuring out the truths of nature, uh, satisfying our curiosity about those sorts of things. Um, there are other things that science might have as secondary goals, right? You might want to then apply the things that you discover to um, make some kind of technology uh, uh, or, or use it in some way. Uh, but the very basic notion is just the notion of finding out those two things. This is what Darwin meant when he said that, you know, it's, it's enough to find out uh, uh, the result of our researches as to what's true without any practically uh, effects even coming from it. Now, not to say that those aren't important, but the basic notion is simply to find out what's the case. Okay? Uh, and it's a matter of what we do with that. And that brings in other, other moral considerations as well. Yeah. So what is your response to people like creationists who say, well, our telos is also the truth, but you are practicing methodological naturalism. By definition, you won't let us introduce our extra natural or supernatural you know, deity, whatever, into the formula. So 
you've kind of locked the doors to keep out people that won't play the game the way you are structuring it. So this was probably the main argument that creationists, uh, the intelligent design creationists made. Uh, it, it's, it was not a new argument. They just put it in a, in a new way, really in a way that made use of some of these uh, ideas from uh, the postmodern uh, critique uh, of science. Uh, and uh, my response in trying to argue for what science is actually doing was to distinguish something I think they didn't clearly distinguish, which is the difference between a methodological uh, claim, right? Methodological naturalism is about a way of uh, investigating things versus a metaphysical way, which is a way of saying about something about what actually is the case metaphysically, ontologically about the world. Uh, and the way they set up the problem is as though there's a forced choice between uh, the metaphysics of the world, right, which would include uh, gods and, and so on. Uh, and by setting up this as a forced choice, what it let them do, or at least what they attempted to do, was to say, if we can just reject the um, the scientific conclusions that leaves us with the other. Okay? If there are only two options, if you reject this one, you get the other one, uh, which essentially puts into play something where they think that you get a metaphysical conclusion from mm -hmm. from a, a, a much simpler kind of uh, 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 empirical conclusion. And that I think was the 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 problem with the approach. It was it was actually just a, a revision of the old creationist approach yeah. of, of the dual model approach. Yeah. Uh, it's either this or this. They would spend all their time trying to argue against evolution. There's never any positive evidence given for their side of things. Uh, it's a kind of God of the gaps argument uh, in theological terms. Uh, the problem, of course, is that that's not the way that science works. You need to be able to have something where you can say, here's evidence that would be for, here's what it would mean to have evidence against, so that you actually have a test of your hypothesis. If this were truly a hypothesis, that's to say a metaphysical hypothesis, uh, presumably you'd be able to say something about that. Um, but it seems to me as though it's never put in a way uh, that makes that possible. Um, and that's not what science does. We're not out, out the, in, in the business of trying to get metaphysical truths, right? Where you have a much more uh, mundane notion of truth that we're after. Empirical truths about the natural world. Yeah, that's Partly my answer, too, is that, well, what would it look like if there was a supernatural intervention? I mean, the implication is that the deity reaches into the world to stir the particles somehow to create the bacterial flagellum or the eye or RNA into DNA or the cure Aunt Mary's cancer or whatever they think is happening when the DNA intervenes. How would you measure that? Uh, and, you know, so there, is, there are some proposals like the, the famous uh, Herbert Benson studies on prayer and, and uh, illness and healing. Uh, that showed no difference between the control group and the experimental group. But at least there was an attempt to show that being prayed for might make a difference, and it didn't. But but had it made a difference, then you'd still ask, have to ask the question, well, what is it you think is going on with the prayer besides a placebo effect? The implication is that a supernatural entity enters into our world to stir the particles. Well, now you have like the mind-body problem. How is it that the this mind-like entity makes contact with physical stuff, you know, to change the atoms or molecules in the DNA to, or whatever it is you think the deity is doing, at some point it just becomes impossible to test and it's just an assertion. So I think it's even worse than that um, because I think that in that particular study, um, uh, they're not really even testing a supernatural notion there. What they're doing is is reconceiving that as a natural uh, uh cause effect relationship All right there's no point at which you have any way of controlling is god in or out of the picture at all the only thing that they were controlling for was prayer or not right, right. and they're thinking of this somehow as though it's a a causal process determined by the prayer right but that's essentially reconceiving of this as a natural process, right. not as a supernatural one and so on. So I would say that that didn't function as a test of a supernatural hypothesis at all. Uh, what it did was essentially reconceive uh, it as a natural, uh, a natural problem. And then, of course, as you said, uh, it, it didn't pan out. Yeah. Let, let's talk a little bit about 
the, the scientific community, uh, you, you talked about, I think it was Merton's, you know, outline. And the first one was communism with quotes that it's, it's he meant a communal activity. I deal with a lot of people who are outsiders, fringers, uh, you, you know, you hate to call them pseudoscientists because, you know, no one in the history of the world has ever called himself a pseudoscientist. And, you know, I'm going down to my pseudo lab to run some pseudo experiments to test my pseudo theory. You know, they think they're doing science. And I get these letters all the time, you know, people that have theories of, I call them theories of everything. You know, Newton was wrong and Einstein was wrong. But I've worked out this new theory about the universe, you know, and and uh, so I always ask them, well, did you run it by like the local high school physics teacher or something? Just to, you know, just to make sure you got the basics. Right. Oh, no, they would never accept it. You know, scientists are dogmatic. They're closed minded. They're flatlanders. They always use this analogy between, you know, that, that the little novel flatland. They can't see the three dimensionality and so on. And right. uh, so. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's this idea that that it's a little bit of an elitist club and, you know, I don't have a Ph.D. I never went to college. Therefore, I'm not allowed to play the game. That's not fair. You know, this should be a democracy of knowledge. I can figure this out on my own. What's wrong with that argument and what is the communal nature of science? Why is it structured that way? So this is actually a pretty interesting um question and even the challenge that's made in the way that you pose it I think is is interesting because it's true that science is about the fact that anyone at least in principle should be able to get the same results I mean, this this is the idea of finding out something by evidence as opposed to just accepting something on authority um, if you had to be an authority in order to pronounce upon some conclusion um, that would be a very different kind of, of thing than what scientists do. In fact, part of what I uh, argue in the book is that there's uh, a difference between the idea of arguments from authority and arguments from evidence, and that that was the basis of the scientific mindset uh, in the scientific revolution. Okay? They rejected out of hand the idea that by authority, someone um, uh, could say whether it be the king or the priest or something, that that's what makes it so. Uh, and they would only look then at what the evidence says. Okay? But the idea about that is it shouldn't matter who looks at the evidence. Anyone should be able to look at the evidence. You don't need to have a degree because <laughs> having right. a degree is like having authority again, if you put it in that way. Okay? Right. Um, so in some sense, you think, well, what these people are saying is is fair, there ought to be some sense in which you don't have to have your PhD in order to be able to, to do science. And that's obviously right. Um, on the other hand, science has got pretty complicated. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and in many cases, you need to know a lot before you're in a position to even be able to uh, understand how the experiments work and to be able to make the judgments about what the evidence is uh, is showing. And that's the difference here. It's not that you're in authority by virtue of having this elite degree. It's that you've put the work in. You've earned uh, something that I would say is expertise. Right. So this is the distinction I want to make. Uh, authority comes from the notion of authorship. Right. The, uh, the idea of originating uh, something. And if you can say something is true by virtue of your authority, there are certain circumstances, of course, in which that's right. You know, if you're if you're a judge, right, you have the authority to pronounce certain things just by virtue of being a judge. Okay? Um, if you're a legislator, right, you have the ability by virtue of your position together with your other colleagues, right, to pronounce and make something law simply by saying so, right, right. by voting for it. And so on. that's what authority is. You get to originate something. The idea of expertise is that the idea comes from the from uh from the idea of trying. Uh, that's what the root of the term comes from, uh, from trying or testing something. And that's different. And, and that's the difference between uh, a power-based model uh, and an evidence-based model. And I would say that what you do in science is you earn your credentials, right? You earn your expertise. It's not like uh, anyone off the street could do anything uh, without without practicing it without without taking the time to learn it. But if they did take the time, right, if they did earn the degree, then presumably they they 
would be in a position to be able to make the same uh, observations, the same experiments, and so on. And in principle, that's what makes science work, right? Mm. Anyone should be able to step into that with the right training yeah. and to then see the evidence for itself rather than just accepting what someone says. Yeah, Steve, and clearly those people haven't done that. <laughs> most of them don't. Yeah, Steve Gould wrote a, a, a delightful essay in one of his monthly columns uh, about he was going to Caltech, I think, or maybe USC or something to give a widely advertised public talk. And he got a call from Feynman who said, oh, man, you're going to be in town. Can we have lunch? I've got some ideas. I want to bounce off of you. So basically Feynman regaled him for an hour with his theory of what turned out to be basically sexual selection. And Gould is like, you know, they, we figured this out like a century ago. <laughs> and Feynman is <laughs> like, I don't like to read what other people have already done in an area so I can come at it fresh. And then, and then Gould, Gould's conclusion was, that's not always good. It's good to know what people have already done and the mistakes exactly. they've made and so on. Uh, exactly. th there's a, a no. uh, this, this computer scientist mathematician named Gelertner who wrote a piece two weeks ago in the Claremont Review of Books, which is kind of a conservative, right-leaning publication, basically taking up Darwin again, you know, the umpteenth time this has been done. You know, from a mathematical computer model perspective, I didn't read the article in detail, uh, that th this is why natural selection cannot operate the way we think it does and so on. And big challenges and problems with Darwinism. And to his credit, Jerry Coyne sat down and deconstructed the whole thing and posted what the critique was. And, and again, here's a, a brilliant, smart mathematician. He's credentialed in one area, and then he jumps over to this other area, clearly not realizing that this has all been worked out, you know, like over the last century. Right. This is the thing about expertise, right? The fact that you get a PhD in science doesn't mean that you're uh, equally expert in all areas of science. Right. Uh, and, and it, boy, it takes a long time now to become an expert in some areas. Uh, Herbert Simon thought it was about 10 years to become an expert in, in, uh, in some area. Uh, and in, in most areas of science, boy, you spend not just your undergraduate time, but you then spend your graduate years and then off at a postdoc and so on. Uh, and to think that that means that you're able to then switch over to some other even scientific discipline uh, and make a contribution, uh, that's that's not really plausible in, in, in many cases. Sometimes you do. I mean, occasionally there are these amazing things where something in your area really does apply in a way people haven't thought of. That's great. Uh, but Mostly you need to do the work first to earn it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it, it's not it's not transferable uh, when it comes to the to the details of the con of the context. One of these outsiders I've been dealing with the last year or so is a guy named Graham Hancock, who is a well, he sort of self described alternative archaeologist. Now he's not one of the ancient alien peoples. He he thinks that there was an advanced civilization, you know, more than ten thousand to probably closer to twenty or thirty thousand years ago. Uh, and so what he does, his system is to focus on the anomalies in various studies, archaeological studies and sites around the world. So this gets us to the problem of what you do with anomalies and, you know, the Cunian model of you, you, you have this sort of normal science and then you have these anomalies that build up. Sometimes they're enough to overturn the, the, the paradigm, sometimes not. What do you do with anomalies? And this, in this case, Graham, he's not, he's an outsider, he's a journalist, but he's a brilliant writer. He's a, he's a really smart guy. He travels around the world. He goes to these sites. And and basically, his books are accumulation of, here's all the weird things that archaeologists tell me they can't explain. And to me, they point to this idea of this ancient civilization. And so I was on Joe Rogan's podcast for four hours with this guy and another guy. And it, it you know I kept, I kept trying to make the point, I, I think I failed, that you know, Graham is not the only alternative archaeologist. I mean, he was frustrated that uh, Zahi Hava, Z Zah, what's his name? The guy ahead of antiquities at uh, the Great Pyramid, uh, Hava, Hava, Havi, Havas, would not see him or would not embrace his idea. And it's like, you're like the hundredth guy this year alone that's come to the Great Pyramids to give the alternative theory. You got to understand, well, this is the dogmatic, closed-minded, conservative nature of science. They're They're locked into this you know, this model and they can't get out of it and so on. So let's talk a little bit about how science, why it is somewhat conservative out of sort of out of necessity, because lots of people can focus on the anomalies. There's a, there's a reason the normal science is normal, at least most of the time. So, so the way that evidence works, right, is that you have to think, uh, how is um, the thing I'm going to look at to test my uh, hypothesis going to be relevant to, 
to the hypothesis that I have. Okay, so anyone can come up with a hypothesis, and and you know there's nothing special about that. There are lots of cases where scientists, you know, had it in a dream or something of this sort, right? That that doesn't make it make it science. It's because you have a good idea. It's what you do to test it. Okay, um, but the thing about evidence is that you don't get uh, evidential claims tested in isolation, right? They're connected to other hypotheses and to other evidence that supported those, right? So there's a network of, of interrelation of hypotheses, well-tested, less tested, uh, and evidence, stronger, weaker for each of those. Uh, and whenever you're proposing something new, it's not um, going to stand or fall your new hypothesis just by virtue of the one thing you're looking at, mm -hmm. uh, especially if it's a really interesting hypothesis. I mean, if this guy were right, boy, there's this ancient civilization. I'm not, I'm not sure the details of what he thinks. That would be pretty radical. Yeah, right? I think yeah. people would be very interested in that, right? If, if you could, if you could show that, archaeologists would think, "Wow, that's that's really pretty neat, right? We totally missed that." Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the other hand, right, the fact that it's such a radical, it would cause such a radical shift. What it means is it's connected to lots of other things that are already in place, right? To hypotheses that have been independently tested and tested against each other against a web of, uh, of evidence that's already out there. So for this to be true, it would mean that there's a lot of things that would have to be wrong. Right? And that's the sense in which you get sort of a conservative uh, uh, notion, uh, because if something's well tested, it means you ought to hold on to it unless you've got really good evidence to say that you ought to overturn it. Uh, and and revolutions in science, despite what Kuhn said, um, are, are not the sort of thing that we're really after, right? The thing right. we're after is is truth, right? And what a revolution does is it shows us that sometimes we can be really wrong, uh, and sometimes we really do have to reconceive the way that we um, model the world because the evidence really has gone against it. Kuhn actually didn't think that scientific revolutions happened very often, right? There, mm -hmm. You just have a couple of examples, but there have been ones. Um, but the goal is not to have a scientific revolution. The goal is to have an integrated view that actually is as close as you can get or closer and closer to uh, finding out things about reality. Um, and that's the sense in which I think when you have something really radical like these proposals, you know, you don't take them just with a grain of salt. You take them with a shaker of salt because <laughs> right. it would take a long time to sort of say, you know, how would we adjust this, this, and this, and this? Because all these things would be affected by that shift. Not that they wouldn't be excited. I think scientists would love if something truly radical like that happens. But it would take a lot to convince them. Yeah, the week I was on that uh, Joe Rogan podcast with Graham Hancock, there was a study published in Nature. You know, of course, he made a big deal about this because it's nature. And it was the claim that there was a find in San Diego uncovered by a construction crew, you know, a big dig a hole thing, carving out the dirt. And there's some mammoth fossils and some kind of broken stones. And the fossils m look like they might have been broken by the stones. So the implication by the authors was that Perhaps people were here 130,000 years ago, which is what these fossils were dated at. Well, that would be 10 times the age of the Clovis people or the earliest people in, of the Americas. That would be a spectacular find. And uh, so, of course, I, I called my friend Jared Diamond, who follows this stuff, and, and here was his comment. The latest semi-annual new paradigm pre-Clovis claim with a credibility half-life of two days. <laughs> In other words, you know, Jared has heard this so many times in his, you know, 50 year career that, you know, another anomaly, another anomaly, and they never pan out. So I guess the question is, is that how many anomalies pile up that end up panning out to, to overthrow the, say, in this case, the, the, the Clovis first hypothesis, which I guess most archaeologists feel is not no longer supported. But instead of 11,000, it's 13,000 or 16,000, not 100,000 years. Um, you know, that kind of gets that problem of uh, the, the buildup of evidence until enough people go, you know what? There's something wrong with the old theory. We have to abandon that and construct something different. Right. And this is this is what Kuhn pointed out rightly. Um, 
we talk about the Copernican revolution, right, as one of these examples of a true scientific revolution. It, it really does make a big difference whether you think of the earth as being immobile at the center of everything uh, or uh, as something that moves uh, around another body, uh, which itself is in motion. Right? That's a that's a pretty big shift. And it winds up having effects, as I was mentioning before, on lots of other things. It wound up having us um, change the basis of physics. Right. Aristotle goes out the window at that point and we have to have a new physics. That's part of what Galileo does. Um, uh, what was it that did that? Well, it was a bunch of anomalies that started to to be harder and harder to explain, right? Not that scientists at the time didn't put a lot of effort into trying to explain them, or we would now say explain them away. Um, the, uh, the interesting thing geometrically is that you are able to reconceive something with different centers, and, and formally speaking, you can you can make sense of those sorts of things. But at some point, you do get enough where it starts to say, all right, maybe this is getting a bit of a stretch, right? And if someone then comes up with an, a, an alternative way of, of conceptualizing this with uh, uh, a set of laws that make sense and can be tested independently on, on their own terms, that's the point at which you can say, ah, this really is a time to, to totally scrap what we've done before and, and rethink this. That's essentially what Galileo does, right? We have a new physics that arises out of this. Um, and and it's not going to be one or two anomalies, but it's going to be enough that finally people start to think, ah, is there some better way of explaining these things than what we've been using before? And occasionally there is, and that's great. Um, uh, but it doesn't happen all that often to that yeah. kind of yeah, and I think it depends on w what the new theory is, too. Again, just to come back to one last example from Graham, which, to his credit, I had never heard of this place, Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, which is an 11,500-year-old site with pretty massive monumental architecture, these gigantic T-shaped stones that are weighing like 50 tons. And, you know, the kind of the, 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 the old paradigm was that in order to have monumental architecture, you need huge populations. So you need a division of labor, you, you, you need agriculture, and this doesn't happen until, you know, after 10,000 years ago, uh, since then. And this is older than that. So therefore, of course, Graham's point is, look, stuff keeps getting older. This is another credit, another point in my argument that this ancient civilization, you know, taught these people how to do this or whatever. But how about that? Because there were hunter-gatherers. They didn't live there. These were just hunter-gatherers. How about an alternative theory is that hunter-gatherers are more sophisticated than we thought they were rather than the other one. So, you know, you, you might, if you're going to overturn the paradigm, you might have two or three competing alternatives to it. And it's just hard to know which, you know, which one you, you slot in there. Well, you, you, you work your way, uh, uh, step by step and, and think what's the, what's a minimal change that could account for these things. And is that change plausible, right? Do we have some other evidence to say that this, uh, uh, I mean, in the one you're su suggesting there, that there might be uh, some more sophistication to the hunter gatherers than we had thought, right? That's that's uh, uh, something that you could get some some independent evidence on, and if that's something that could uh, explain what's going on, then uh, you don't have to make as big of a change in your uh, in your overall uh, theoretical account. Um, so. You start with the easy things, and if you can make sense of it that way, then it seems like that's a that's a more reasonable way to go. Uh, yeah, I think um, part of the problem is back back to this uh, uh, training, getting getting your union card, PhD, and one of the things it does is it trains you in these virtues that you talk about. So talk a little bit about Aristotelian virtues, uh, vir virtue theory that that you actually have to kind of practice it and learn it to develop that as a habit that you just get into the habit of, I'm going to be honest, I'm going to be objective. I'm going to try to look for disconfirming evidence and I'm going to, you know, be cautious in my hypothesizing and so on. That maybe doesn't come so naturally. So maybe there is an argument for going through all those years of, of doctoral training and postdoctoral training actually trains you to be a virtue ethicist in science. So this is the thing that, that I think is, is uh, kind of a weakness in the way that we, teach science and that we could probably do better with. Um, mostly we don't talk about those things explicitly, right? Uh, the Aristotelian point uh, is that 
the virtues that we ought to acquire are the ones that are going to make us better, more excellent at uh, the thing we're aiming for uh, at our at our telos. Okay. Now Aristotle's talking about this in terms of human beings. So what is it to be more excellent, more virtuous as a human being? And and my twist on that is to is to narrow the focus and say let's just think about what it is to be virtuous and excellent in a vocation. Okay. Uh, uh, different vocations have different particular aims. Science has the aim of trying to find out true things about the world. Medicine might have the aim of trying to find out the way to cure uh, someone who's ill. Uh, so different vocations have different different goals. And on a virtue theoretic approach, on my vocational notion of this, is that you ought to, as a member of that vocation, cultivate the virtues that will make you better uh, at achieving that. Okay? That's what excellence is. It's, it's making yourself uh, more likely to uh, achieve what it is that you're that, what you're after as a member of that of that vocation. Um, my hope is that we could start thinking about this explicitly by saying, here are the traits that make for better science. Okay? Um, here are the traits that make for integrity in science, right? Not just methods, okay, but something about ourselves. Yeah. And it seems to me as though we're getting better at doing um, the teaching of methods. That used to be what I talked about all the time. I was, right, you know, right. nature of science. We ought to be getting the methods and practices of science. That's much of my work was on that. And I think we're actually better at that now. Uh, it's now worked into yeah. the science standards. Um, uh, so I think people are starting to recognize that it's more than just what scientists have learned. It's also how they learn it. Uh, but the thing I think is still missing is this part about the values that underlie that, right? What ought we be, what we ought, ought we try to be in order to be better at that, the thing that makes it work? Uh, and I, I actually think that we wind up uh, often in middle school even, um, uh, but certainly in lower lower grades, start to teach science in a way that, that, uh, that makes that invisible, um, uh, it stomps out the curiosity that we all start with, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so the kids who initially, I think all kids are are naturally curious, right? They're all asking why, right? Why, why, why? Right? This is the <laughs> yeah. thing parents have to deal with. Um, and elementary school kids love science, but at some point we start teaching it in such a way where you have to memorize this, do that, and so on. And no longer do you get that feeling of discovering something, which is what really drives science. And around middle school then, and sometimes it goes a little bit later, kids start thinking of science as something that's that's uh, unpleasant and boring and as opposed to exciting and fun. Um, and it seems to me as though that's part of why we're losing um, people in the pipeline, right, mm -hmm. because of the way we teach it. And that if we were to start to bring these in in a more explicit way and and build experiences that actually let you cultivate it, uh, it'd be more likely that people would retain that interest in science. Um, currently, there's some who do, right? They make it through that little hurdle uh, there, uh, keeping their excitement about science. And then in graduate school and so on, they learn to make this habitual. They, they, they learn often through osmosis, right? They're in a lab. They sort of uh, acquire the habits of that lab. It's not often that people talk about these things explicitly in virtue terms, but I would say that implicitly you are kind of learning it by the role modeling that's going on around you. Uh, and certain scientists recognize what's going on. People like Feynman, right? He's, he was someone who not just did it and embodied it, but could also talk about it, right? He, he was great at explaining uh, the scientific mindset. And I think we need to have more teachers like that. And, and give scientists a vocabulary so that they can start to explain to themselves and to others, you know, what is the scientific mindset that makes this whole thing work? Um, uh, and, and that's kind of what the virtues are after here. So just, so, just, just right. go through a couple of what are, what are some of the virtues? Right. So, the, I mean, the, the two central ones are, are curiosity and honesty, right? And, and both of them have to do with the central guiding purpose of science, which is to find out true things about the world, right? Um, you're not likely to be uh, a good scientist. If you're actually not curious about how things work. <laughs> right. Not that everyone has to be a scientist, right? I actually think there are plenty of other good things, other vocations that one might do. Um, 
But if you want to be a scientist, that ought to be something that's really central to your to your mindset. Um, and if you understand what curiosity means, and again, I think this is something that has a biological basis so that we're all we all start with a kind of natural curiosity. But what scientists do is is they just retain this and then they systematize it. Right. I think of I think of science as being systematic curiosity. Um, and what they do is devise methods to make it more likely that they can satisfy their curiosity. Right. And that's where honesty comes in. Right. Uh, or veracity. Um, if you're really after satisfying your curiosity, it's not really that you want your hypothesis to be true. It's rather that you want the true hypothesis to be to become known. Right. You might hope that yours is right. But really, the thing you're after is finding out what what is right. right? And to do that requires the kind of of honesty that Feynman was talking about that we mentioned before. Right. It's, it's this thing about um, being self-critical, um, being um, careful to not have the confirmation bias, right? To know that you might be susceptible to that, but to institute methods to make it less likely that that would get in the way of finding out what we really want. Um, so even if we just start with those two very, very basic central virtues, it has a lot of implications for how we ought to act as research scientists in order to achieve what it is that we're after, which is finding out two things about the world. So talk a little bit about what, when people go off the rails from those virtues, uh, it, both error and fraud. Uh, this does happen. Uh, you know, we have this replication crisis, allegedly, in the, particularly in the social sciences, uh, driven in part by, you know, the complexity of the experiments or the small ends or whatever. But there's also, you know, some implications that people are just fraudulent. So the way the scientific system is set up, you know, how you get grant money, how you get rewarded with pay raises and and, and, and and so forth to full professorship and tenure, all the way up to the Nobel Prize. I had Brian Keating on my podcast who wrote this book about the problem with the Nobel Prizes is that, you know, they're structured to give it to only three people, even though now there's like 100 people on the team that, that, that worked on the project or whatever. But also it, it sets it up to be so competitive that it, it kind of distracts you from these virtues. Like the, the, the telos of science is not truth. It's I got to get the grant or I got to win the prize before that other guy does. So I describe this as being an example of a, of a conflict of interest. Okay? Um, the basic interest of the scientist is to find out true things about the world. Okay? That's, that's the basic thing that we're after. Now, there are other things that can externally motivate you, right? You need to have money to run your um, run your project. You need a salary. You need you have a life. Um, um, but those are external goods, and this actually is something that's pretty basic within virtue theory, um, which is the idea that a practice is defined by its internal goods, uh, and that part of what identifying as a member of that practice is identifying with those internal goods, as opposed to external goods. So I'll just give you an example. It's from Alistair McIntyre, who, who defined um, this notion of a practice in a more general way. But he says, look, you know, if you're if you're just learning to play chess, right, you're trying to keep, teach your kid chess, uh, you might encourage them with the motivation of a candy, right? You say, you know, if you get this right, you know, you get a, you get this little prize and so on, and that motivates your child to learn the rules and to learn how to do this and so on. Those are external goods, okay? The the rewards that you get. Um, but he says what really happens eventually, or what ought to happen, is that after a while you do learn the rules of chess, and you do learn something about the play of the game and uh, the value of good moves over bad moves, and you recognize them intrinsically as such, and you like to play games because of the the coolness of the game, right? Not because of the candy. And at that point, the external rewards are sort of set aside. If you're a real player, not that you don't want to to win your tournament or you know raise some points in your in your score, but the real thing that makes you a player are the internal rewards. Okay, now what does that mean with regard to science? The Nobel Prize and all of these sorts of things, mm -hmm. those are external rewards, right? Those are external goods. And Feynman actually 
was really opposed to them. Right. Yeah. He, he said, he, you know, he was ready to turn down. He, he actually hung up on the person when they called him at three o'clock in the morning to, <laughs> to right. say that he'd won the Nobel Prize. And he said, you know, these are appalls. These are these are just um, superfluous. And, and he talked about this because his father had kind of impressed upon him that that, you know, what you wear uh, is not really who you are. You know, he was he was actually in the uniform business. He says, you know, take off your clothes. You know, we're all the same. We all go to the bathroom. We all do the same thing. And don't get lost by the by the the medals and the and the and the fancy clothes. And and Feynman said, you know, that he thought that those things were just um, generally bad. Right? He he resigned from various um, honor organizations when he was a, a student. Uh, uh, but he did accept the Nobel Prize, right? Uh, and and he his, did. Uh, was a journalist <laughs> who convinced him that it would be more of a hassle to not do it. Um, uh, he has a pretty negative view about that. And I think it's because he put so much uh, weight upon the internal goods, as you should. Right? I would say that what's happening in these cases of fraud is, is that you have someone who hasn't really learned to identify as a scientist, or maybe they never were a scientist and they were they were drawn by the the external notions. Oh, I'll get a good paying job. You know, you don't actually go into academic science to make money. You should, you <laughs> right. should. That's, not, that's not, not, not the reason. Um, but if you're, if you're conflicted in that kind of way, I would say that tells us that you're not truly a scientist, right? You're motivated by something else. Uh, and that's part of the way that you can tell uh, why something can get off the rails, as you as you say, uh, it's someone who's following a different star, right? They want to get an accolade as opposed to want to find out what's true. Their telos has been uh, redirected. I mean, the the pull of fame and notoriety, and it's gotten worse with social media and popular books and and so forth. Uh, I I can I can I can certainly see the motivation why it happens. But really, as Gould always pointed out about the creationists, it's always scientists. It's almost always scientists that find out that the other scientist was fraudulent or made a mistake. It, it's not like the creationists discovered that so-and-so was wrong about their, their evolutionary theory or discovery. It's usually other scientists. So in, in a way, it's a virtue. And speaking of virtue, of course, my favorite section of your book is skepticism in science, because, of course, you, <laughs> you cite my magazine Skeptic and, and my friends Skeptical Inquirer and the Mythbusters. Although I do have one little one little bone to pick with you, science clubs. They're not clubs. We're not a club. We're a society. <laughs> you guys are. There are clubs. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, there, there are, are small. There are small groups. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm thinking about the the, the groups on campus and so yeah, on. They're, that's they're right. yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah that's you're right. right. <laughs> but so talk about uh, what is the virtue of skepticism? I mean, what does it even mean to be a skeptic? I have to. I, I answer this question all the time, so I want to hear what how you would answer that. What does it mean to be a skeptic? What is skepticism? So, so I think of skepticism as one of the scientific virtues, uh, and it's a virtue because of what it does. Okay? Um, if you again think of of the way you you identify something as a virtue, it's in relationship to what the telos is, what the goal of the of the vocation is. Okay, so if our goal in science is to find out true things about the world, and we're cognizant of the fact that we can be um, misled by our own desires, okay? uh, even by external goods, okay? uh, or just by you know, the hope that our hypothesis is the right one. Right? Knowing that, um, you'd have to say, what attitude should I have to make sure that, that I am not less likely to succeed at my endeavor? Okay? Skepticism turns out to be one of those things that's useful in that respect, because skepticism says, Hold on a second, not so fast. Okay, uh, it says, um, let's uh, wait until we can see what the evidence tells us, because we know that um, we might misjudge that. Okay, we know we might be self-deceptive. Okay, we know that someone else might be lying, or, or you know, any number of things. Um, and if you were to just accept what someone else said, then you'd be going back to the notion of authority. Okay, and so. Skepticism helps you prevent that. But more than that, it also prevents you from self-authority, right? You might say, this is my view, <laughs> and, so right. and and think that that's the end of the matter. But one of the most important things, and, and I think this is why you build methods in the way that science does, is so that you have skepticism of self, right? 
the basic notion of skepticism is, you know, skepticism of dogma. But you can also, you ought to have skepticism of others. You ought to have skepticism of received wisdom, but also skepticism of yourself. Um, not in the sense of our goal is to be negative. And this is the sense in which I actually um, think that the term can be sort of misleading, even 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 the way that we typically use it, right, in, in the skeptic society and, and so on. Because it seems, uh, at least on the face of it, as being uh, just a negative thing. You should be skeptic of something. It's, and, right, so on. Right. and I would say that's not that's not the basis of science, right? It's a part of a method of science which helps us to get to what the positive thing is, which is to find out what's so. Okay? Right. So with, I would say that curiosity is more central to uh, to the identity of science. And what skepticism does is give you a really important um, part of your attitude to make sure that you're more likely to achieve that, right, by not fooling yourself or not being fooled by others um, uh, and by forcing you to say, let me look again at the evidence. Okay? Let me make sure that I'm not being fooled by uh, by misinterpretation of something of yeah. that sort. Uh, so that's 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 the way that I think of it. Um, too often, uh, I think people just I mean, this is this is the problem I'm sure you encounter all the time. They sort of think of of skeptics as just the debunkers, right? Uh, That's right. Oh, you're out, you know to debunk uh, Bigfoot and UFOs and this exactly, and that. Exactly. You're, you're you're the no fun guys, right? <laughs> exactly. Right. Uh, and and I think that's not what it's after, right? What <laughs> what it's really after is is an exemplification of an attitude, which is to say, let's see what the evidence actually says, not to drag something down. Uh, but rather to make sure that we're getting something right. right. And it's the positive notion I think you would rather uh, emphasize. Yeah, absolutely. I think of it as just sort of the default position you start with, and then you overturn the skepticism if there's enough evidence to do so. I got a shout-out yesterday on Joe Rogan's podcast. He had Dan Aykroyd on as his guest. They got to talking about a remake of Ghostbusters, and people like Michael Shermer are never going to believe in ghosts. And and by the way, UFOs and, the, and, and people like Shermer never know what they're talking about with the UFO stories. And we have lots of stories. And it's Anyway, so I just tweeted out and said, I, I would believe that aliens came here if you just show me a body or show me the actual spacecraft. Instead, what we get are these you know, grainy videos and blurry photographs and anecdotes about things that go bump in the night. And that's not evidence in science. You know, if you want to name a new species in biology, you have to have a type specimen, a holotype. Like that's the one right there. You can see it. I can see it. You can dissect it, photograph it, put it in the museum and so on. And I, I think a lot of people seem to feel like anecdotes should count as evidence. And if you have a lot of anecdotes, you know, that we have 10,000 sightings of UFOs. And that's better than a thousand, and that's better than a hundred. And to, to, to some people, that's accumulating accumulating evidence that should lead to this conclusion. Yeah. So uh, one of the the things that I had most fun with in my Tower of Babel book was the the Rielians, uh, oh, yeah. who also had an intelligent design uh, view of the world, but it, they thought it was the aliens who had who had done it, right. and. and uh, uh, many of the arguments that they gave against evolution were exactly the same ones that the creationists gave. Uh, uh, but but they had nothing in the way of positive uh, evidence on their side either. So it's all kind of God of the gaps type arguments or something of the gaps like, you know, like Stan Friedman, who was the big UFO guy. He just died a few months ago. But his evidence were that he would hold up these government documents with big blacked out paragraphs. And for him, that's evidence. You see, they're covering up the UFOs. It's like. No, it's just an empty gap, <laughs> and your imagination is filling in what's in that gap, and that's the problem there. Um, all right, a few other things. I've t I, I read your book pretty carefully here, so I have a bunch of dog-eared pages uh, uh, that I want to do. Oh, I know. I, I was going to read you something that I wrote about in the Moral Arc from research by, I don't know if you know, Louis... Leibenberg. He's a amateur scientist. He's a professional tracker. He does some history of science. So it, it, it's this professional tracking thing that I'm interested in. And uh, he argued that our ability to reason scientifically is a byproduct of fundamental skills for tracking game animals that our ancestors developed. Leibenberg's analogy between tracking and the scientific method is revealing, quote, as new factual information is gathered in the process of tracking, hypotheses may have to be revised 
and substituted by better ones. A hypothetical reconstruction of the animal's behaviors may enable trackers to anticipate and predict the animal's movements. These predictions provide ongoing testing of hypotheses. So he talks about, you know, if, well, here, I'll just continue on here. Uh, whenever these c- cognitive capacities arose, once the neural architecture is in place to deduce, say, that a lion slept here last night, a person can substitute lion with any other animal or object and can swap here with there and last night with tomorrow night. The objects and time elements of the reasoning process are interchangeable. In a modern example, once you've mastered the multiplication tables and you know that 7 times 5 is 35, you can infer that 5 times 7 is also 35 because 5 and 7 are interchangeable in the equation. This interchangeability is a byproduct of the neural systems that evolve for basic reasoning abilities, such as tracking animals for food. So I always use this as an example of, you know, sort of counter that evolution did not create our brains to um, form an accurate picture of nature. In fact, I think it does. And I think the very scientific process of hypothesis testing, that's what trackers do. Make inferences. And this kind of gets us to, um, you know, I want to ask you about Karl Popper and this description of science is conjecture and refutation and how 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 well that philosophy of science has held up in you know the last few decades so there are a number of things i'd, I'd like yeah, to, yeah, yeah, to yeah. talk about what you just said i mean because there's interesting interconnection of a number of things right popper in particular had uh, a really important influence upon um thinking about what science was that was part of what he was after to try to say how you could demarcate science from other things uh, and his notion of falsifiability uh, still talked about by many today as being as being sort of the hallmark of that it turned out there were some technical problems with the way that he put this forward uh, so that i think within philosophy of science we don't any longer think of of popperian falsification as, as the, way, the way to think about this but he was certainly right with regard to the idea of of testing right you want to be able to have tests that really test which means that you need to have something where that could go wrong, right? That's why he focused on the idea of a falsification. Um, he didn't allow anything positive, though. And right? the, the way that he thought about it, you could never have positive evidence for something. That was part of the problem. Mm. So I think today we, we talk about this more in terms of um, the not falsifiability, but sort of the confirmation. You can have confirmation, which is positive, disconfirmation, which is negative, and inductive reason gives you more or less, right? You'd, you'd have evidence that accrues in favor, or you could have evidence that goes against, right? And, and so you wind up weighing these sorts of things. So that's the notion of test. You have to be able to have both. Popper used a Darwinian notion with regard to scientific hypothesis, saying, you know, you have hypotheses competing for each other, competing with each other, and part of what you do is uh, subject them to the... Uh, evidence of the world, and some of them will fail, and others will survive to fight another day, right? And Popper thought that you never had anything that you could say in the end. Now we've we've discovered this. He thought it was always a matter of all we can do is say that we haven't yet disconfirmed it, we haven't yeah. yet falsified it. And again, that 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 was an error. He goes it was too far in this. Um, but the general idea is one that uh, others have made as well. That you can think about this as being a quasi-Darwinian process where there is um, competition among alternatives, I'll to say alternative hypotheses, and that some will fare better or worse in relationship to the evidence of the world, right? So I would think about this in terms of models, right? You're offering your model, someone else is offering theirs, and part of what you're doing is to say, how well do these work at fitting with the world? How well do they explain the world, the things that we see? This gets back to the anomalies, right? Mm-hmm. Something is an anomaly under one uh, theoretical approach, but under the other, it's explicable. Ah, well, that suggests that this one's better. Okay. Um, so those, uh, I think, are are ways in which it's, it's, it's right. Um, there's something about the overall method that mimics this biological notion. But the first thing you said, uh, I want to tie back to, because yeah. that's also something I think is actually important, which is how this can have some roots in a biological process. Um, the quote that you had from um, uh, the hunter uh, tracking, tracking yeah. notion, John, I would say is 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 interesting, but it's at way too high a level, uh, mm. much much too close to us, right? Uh, 
I, I think that the epistemological basis in biology for our ability to find out things about the world has to be way, 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 way back, right? This is this is before you get hominids, before you get mammals. I mean, it goes way back because you have to be able to find out the things of the world which will make a difference to you as an organism to whether you'll be able to survive and reproduce. You mean like, like classical, that, classical conditioning, something really simple? Well, um, conditioning perhaps. I, I, I would argue – that you've got to have the basis for learning, right? Conditioning comes in at the learning part. Uh, but I would say that that um, you have to evolve cognitive mechanisms, even before you have a brain, perhaps. You have to maybe it's just reflexive yeah. mechanisms yeah. Uh, that would allow you to have the ability to essentially find out what kind of a world you're in and appropriately um, move, react, behave in, in relationship to that. So the work that I do on digital organisms is, mm. is in part to investigate how you can get the origin and evolution of essentially the precursors to intelligence and intelligent behavior. And on my view, this has to go way, 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 way back before you get anything close to what we have or what the trackers yeah. would have. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, even just, well, just association learning, connecting A to B. I mean, this is what we do. This is the whole basis of anecdotes and why it, it's so tricky and slightly different than the scientific method, because anecdotal thinking, you're just connecting A to B. You know, so my kid has autism and w what's the closest thing that happened? I got him vaccinated. You know, and that, that just comes naturally to people. We just look for the, the, the first, you know, sort of causal element that comes into play. You talk about that a little bit. I wanted to mention um, I, uh, I think one of the things that bothers psychologists about Malcolm Gladwell's in part, huge success. So there's a little bit of jealousy. I think like, I wish I had a book that sold 3 million copies. Uh, but, but critically that, you know, he, he's just basically taken a few anecdotes that seem to fit a hypothesis that comes into his brain. And he's such a great writer. He constructs it in a way that's very compelling. So the example I use on this is I, I recently did a, a documentary thing where I was asked about the connection between uh, horror films and spooky things that happen to the actors or on the set or after the, film was done to the actors' lives and so on. And so, you, 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 you know, you have the two-by-two two grid. So the, the producers were only interested in horror movies in which spooky things happen. So I pointed out, what about horror movies where nothing spooky happened? Like, I think The Exorcist, nothing weird happened to, to them or, or The Shining or whatever. And then you have non-spooky movies or non-horror movies in which spooky things happen. And I gave them examples of that. And I think this is one of the critiques of people like Malcolm Gladwell that He's only looking at the one cell, like his latest book, How to Talk to Strangers. You know, people that don't know how to talk to strangers and then bad things happen, like the police end up shooting somebody on the side of the road or whatever. What about all the times when, you know, we don't know how to talk to strangers and nothing bad happens or you you're a, you have a perfectly good communication with strangers and bad things happen? You know, So it's that kind of selective process. So the anecdotes only get us so far. You need some training to remember the grid. And, you know, when I told this to the producers, they're like, oh, yeah, spooky horror movies where nothing happened. Never thought of that. <laughs> yeah, they're not they're not as they're not as fun. Right. So it's, it's interesting to talk about the other thing. Right. But what you've described there in the grid uh, is essentially a, a way of thinking about um, the the need for a control. Right? right. If you only look for positive things in, in your favor, then you haven't actually looked to see. You know, could there be something negative? Right. This is the idea of a real test. The real test has to show something that could go the other way. Right. Uh, and the reason that you have controls is in part to make sure that what's going on causally was the result of this element. Right. The variable that you're that you're testing as opposed to some other one that you maybe you overlooked or didn't, didn't think about. Um, and if you don't have that, it's not a real test. Right. That's the thing that that makes it a test. Uh, and, and this then relates to the idea of that we talked before about uh, putting something at risk. Right? Popper talked about this. You have to put your hypotheses at risk. That part he, he's he's right about. Um, it's also the, the part about skepticism that comes into play again. Right. If you only look for positive um, anecdotes or examples, you've never put your ideas to the test. Right. And you should be skeptical of your own views as well. Uh, and that's what the other um quadrants are doing, right? They're thinking about these cases. And once you do that, you essentially have controls and, and ways of checking to see, all right, is there a real pattern there 
or was it only an apparent pattern because I only looked at at, uh, at this one grid? Oh, yeah. By the way, on the positive evidence side of things, I was thinking when you were talking, I was thinking about climate change. I mean, what what switched it for me, maybe around 2005 or so when I started looking into it, was all the different independent lines of evidence in, in a positive way that pointed this one conclusion, like, you know, the melting of the glaciers and then the, the shifting of ecological systems to later, later in the year when they would come online. Um, you know, the CO2, uh, you know, levels and sea level rise, you know, there was like a dozen different things. And it's not like these guys all meet on the weekends to get their story straight. Like creationists think evolutionists do, you know, these are independent scientists and it's not that they're falsifying some other theory. It's that they're accumulating positive evidence that there's nothing else that explains why the glaciers would melt and the ecological system shift would shift earlier and earlier in the year because it's getting warmer and, and so on. And all kind of points to that one conclusion. This is this is what uh, is called consilience of evidence. Uh, it's the idea that if you have multiple lines of evidence that point to the same thing, right, it should increase your confidence in that. Um, um, if you only had one line of evidence, you could still give you some confidence. But if you can get the same, I mean, this, the, this was uh, part of the reason that people started to believe in atoms because people say, oh, it's a useful fiction and so yeah. on. But if you could actually calculate the number of atoms in something and you could do it in several different independent ways and get the same number, that was an indication that there really were atoms there, right? So that's part of how evidence works, right? There's some independence of lines of support for something. Uh, and that should be a reason to say, uh, I'm not just making this up. We're not just seeing a part of the pattern by my point of view, right? It essentially lets you triangulate on something to the point that you eventually can say with confidence, uh, well, atoms are real. Uh, climate change is real. Yeah. Uh, I also want to ask you about science and religion since Tower of Babel came out and this book, your new book came out. We've had the, you know, the new atheists and the new atheist movement. And, you know, it's kind of splintered and there's something of a uh, of a division between those who, who think we should be more militant, like Dawkins and Hitchens, maybe, or you should be more conciliatory about it. Uh, and that kind of gets down to whether or not you think, say, God is a testable hypothesis and it's failed the test. And therefore, people that believe in it should re reject that hypothesis. And if they don't, they're delusional or whatever. What is your stand when people ask you about the God question, religion? I assume you're an atheist. I actually don't even know. Uh, and, and how do you tackle that as a philosopher of science? So this actually relates back to the question before about metaphysical naturalism versus mythological yeah. naturalism, okay? uh, And it seems to me as though most of the cases where people take the view that God is a hypothesis that has been disproven, right? I think that's what you're yeah. pointing to in, in at least some of the new atheists and so on. Um, uh, I would say what they're doing is uh, naturalizing a view of God, right? They're, they're, they're taking... Um, a theological term, but they're essentially viewing it as though it were a natural hypothesis, right? As though there's a person, you know, there's a, there's this, you know, something, someone like us or something of that sort. Um, and if you put it in that kind of realm, then you sort of think, oh, well, it's, it's testable like, like uh, other natural hypotheses would be. Um, um, but the problem with that is that I would say that you've essentially changed the concept at that point, right? You're no longer really thinking of it as a supernatural being or yeah. thing or something. Yeah. I mean, uh, the whole idea, if you take that notion seriously as a supernatural thing, something that's beyond the cause effect um, structure of the world, which is what methodological naturalism presupposes that we're going to, to take for granted that kind of a system. And supernatural says, now, this is something that's complete outside that. It's not like this at all, right? That's that's what the, the notion means. If you take that seriously, and it seems to me as though it, theologically, that's what people uh, try to insist, right? God is not like us, right? right. Don't, don't try to assume that you can read God's mind or something like that. It's just totally foreign. If it's, if it's like that, which I would say is a standard theological view, then you've not really taken it seriously to say that it's, you know, the guy up in the clouds and so on, that right. naturalized it and so on. So I would say you really haven't tested that view. Uh, it's not a it's not a scientific hypothesis. So in that sense, it's not testable. You, you need to set that 
uh, uh, as uh, something that's that's just outside the realm. And, you know, as Huxley said, you know, that's why one is agnostic about right, it. I mean, right. it's the basis of being an agnostic, which that, is to that say it's, it's, that it's not knowable. It's, it's clear. I think a lot of listeners think that agnostic means I, I just have an open mind. I'm waiting for one more experiment to make up my mind say about climate change. I'm agnostic otherwise. In the God realm, there is no, this is what Huxley meant, there is no experiment that's ever going to be run that's going to say, yep, for sure, or no, or whatever. I was at a, right. I was at a conference with uh, Ken Miller and Richard Dawkins. So Dawkins asked, you know, Ken is a Catholic, and, you know, he accepts Jesus was, was resurrected, you know, and uh, crucified and resurrected, and, and so forth. And Richard asked him, if we found a piece of the true cross, I mean, really, and there was some flesh on there, and we got Jesus' DNA, what would it look like? <laughs> you know, and Ken's response was, you're missing the point. I, I'm not claiming I can prove any of this. This is just my faith tradition. It's just what I believe. I don't, you know, th th there's no experiment we're going to run. We're not going to do a PCR test on Jesus' DNA and find out that, you know, he's haploid or whatever. Uh, you know, so to what, and I, I like Ken Miller. He's a good friend. And, and, and so was uh, Martin Gardner, who, would, who, who was a, a fideist which drove skeptics crazy. It's like, here is one of our greatest debunkers of Uri Geller and psychics and so on. And yet he says, I believe there is a God and there's an afterlife and I pray and so on. I can't prove it. I think the atheists have slightly better arguments than the theists, but I believe anyway, uh, in, in, in a pragmatic sense, it works for me. Do you cut people like that slack and go, okay, fair enough. Or, or, or as a philosopher, is that not really a solid position to take? I think it's a totally solid position to take, right? Part of part of what you do that I think makes these discussions seem intractable is that that people have in mind a particular notion of God that they care about, right? Um, and it usually goes back to how they grew up and, you know, the notion that they learned as a kid. Um, and if you had a really specific uh, idea in mind, you know, it, it might very well be you know, the man in the clouds and so on. And in that case, you could see, well, you know, I don't see any evidence for that. If you, you might you might uh, lose your belief on those sorts of grounds. Um, mm -hmm. For people who are deep in the theology and so on, they'd say, well, that's not really the theological notion here. It's It really is meant to be, you know, other, right? You're not supposed to think of it in that kind of way. Um, and so if you have people who have these different conceptions talking with each other they're really talking past one another and so on yeah. and i think people like gardner uh very reasonably said no you know here's the notion that i have uh which is which is this uh notion that's not testable right so you're not going to be able to uh to give me a scientific um uh test that would that would determine the matter it's a different kind of thing um and i think Gardner would have described himself and from that point of view as, as being agnostic, right? Yeah. Um, um, but having faith, right, is a different sort of thing, right? It's it's to say, this is an area out of which I don't expect evidence. Like this is usually the definition of faith, right? right? Something right. for which you don't have evidence and so on. Um, and I would say, you know, uh, for for that type of view, it's it's completely legitimate, right? As long as you're you're careful about what the uh, what the claims are. Uh, it's it's hard to know uh, how to criticize that. Yeah, Martin, you talk about the Mysterian mystery, certain things that cannot be answered. Either we just don't have the concepts or we have the wrong concepts or our brains are not big enough to conceptualize things. God being one of them, free will determinism being the other one. He was something of a compatibilist, as am I. Uh, but, you know, often comes down to what you mean by these words we're using. We have to use words to communicate. And so these words have a lot of baggage to them. And you know, sometimes it just comes down to what you mean by something. Uh, so this is yeah. the thing that philosophers do, right? It drives people mad, I think, sometimes. Yeah. Uh, which is they, they'll answer or they ask them a question. They say, well, well, it depends on what you mean by that, right? right. And so, well, well, tell me what you mean by it, which is what then philosophers do, right? The key thing we'll do is to say, well, there's this concept and there's this concept, and that's different from this one, right? And and there are three different concepts there, and and then you go about analyzing them independently, uh, recognizing that um, the answers might be different depending upon on which one you're talking about. And so we often use the same word for things, 
And so philosophers all put a little subscript, right, or superscript, right? We mean we mean this sub one, or right. Uh, right. Uh, the reason for doing that, and to try to be precise about it, is so that you can make progress, because otherwise you do just wind up talking past one another. Um, and this is the sense in which I think you can make some philosophical progress to say, well, if you if you separate things out, we can say this is the case here, and this is different over here. And, and and then we might still agree to disagree, but at least we've made some progress. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, Robert, I want to be mindful of your time. We've been going for an hour and a half, but I I I, I don't want to let you off the hook until I, I, I run past you my pet idea about breaking down the is ought wall between uh, uh you know between is and ought the, the naturalistic fallacy. So let me just read you a couple portions of uh, uh, uh fr- from my um, articles on this, in which I make this argument that just as it was inevitable that the astronomer Johannes Kepler would discover that planets have elliptical orbits, given that he was making accurate astronomical measurements and given that planets really do travel in elliptical orbits, he could hardly have discovered anything else. Scientists studying political, economic, social, and moral subjects will discover certain things that are true in these fields of inquiry. For example, democracies are better than autocracies, market economies are superior to command economies, torture and the death penalty do not curb crime, that burning women as witches is a fallacious idea, that women are not too weak and emotional to run companies or countries, and most poignantly here, that blacks do not like being enslaved and that Jews do not want to be exterminated. And then I quote from Steven Pinker's from uh, his Enlightenment Now, in which it might have been from an earlier essay, in which he talks about the, you know, this sort of discovery of platonic truths that scientists agree exists, such as those in mathematics, quoting Pinker, on this analogy, we are born with a rudimentary concept of number. But as soon as we build on it with formal mathematical reasoning, the nature of mathematical reality forces us to discover some truths and not others. No one who understands the concept of two, the concept of four, and the concept of addition can come to any conclusion but that two plus two equals four. Perhaps we are born with a rudimentary moral sense, and as soon as we build on it with moral reasoning, the nature of moral reality, moral reality, forces us to some conclusions, but not others. And then his simplest example, principle of interchangeable perspectives. If I appeal to you to do something that affects me, to get off my foot or tell me the time or not run me over with your car— then I can't do it in a way that privileges my interest over yours, say, retaining my right to run you over with my car, if I want you to take me seriously. Unless I'm a galactic overlord, I have to state my case in a way that would force me to treat you in kind. I can't act as if my interests are special just because I'm me and you're not any more than I can persuade you that the spot I'm standing on is a special place in the universe just because I happen to be standing on it. Okay, so then he quotes like, like Spinoza's viewpoint from eternity, the social contract of Hobbes, Rousseau and Locke, uh, Kant's categorical imperative, Rawls's veil of ignorance, Peter Singer's theory of the expanding circle. In other words, the argument I think he's making and I'm making is that science has discovered certain moral truths, truths with a small t. This is more likely to be true than that. This is better for people than that. And we're discovering them through reason. Therefore, this naturalistic fallacy, I think, is a fallacy that we do shit go from is to ought. Your thoughts and why this is wrong. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I actually read your uh, your pieces here that oh, you yeah. sent. OK. So yeah. I, yeah. OK. Good. Again, quoted the one from uh, from that piece. So yeah. I I had looked at that and so on. So um, let me let me take this back uh, to Darwin again so that you can sort of see how uh, how I think about this. Darwin talks about the evolution of the moral sense. I, I, the very first professional article I wrote was on moral Darwinism, and it's kind of, it was the first account to sort of show how this worked and uh, to think about it from uh, a philosophical point of view, how to, how to make sense of this. Uh, and Darwin's pretty sophisticated about, about this, right? He thinks that um, if, if our physical traits evolved, then it would there's no reason to think that behavioral traits couldn't evolve as well, right? If, as long as there's some genetic basis for, for things, it seems as though mental traits and so on could evolve as well. And so he, he recognizes that sort of the moral sense is going to be something that's going to be a challenge to his view. And he gives an account in The Descent of Man as to why it is that he thinks that we can make sense 
of the evolution of a moral sense. Okay? And he actually has a really interesting way of thinking about this. Um, has to do with with uh, group relations. He actually gives sort of a group selection uh, account of it. Um, uh, but he says, you know, what we get there are the precursors of moral reasoning, uh, but it's only af after a certain point when you get um, the uh, evolution of sufficient intellectual ability to be able to compare previous actions to, to future actions and so on, uh, that you get something that's a more sophisticated notion that you would say is, is really morality. Um, and he tries to compare it to uh, Kant, uh, to uh, utilitarianism, he, I mean, the, the best philosophy of the day, right? So he's cognizant of this, and he's, he gives a, a really good shot, I would say, at, at making sense of this and so on. Um, but one of his examples is, um, look, if, if uh, humans had been reared in the same way that honeybees are, we would think it our sacred duty mm. to kill our uh, our sisters in, 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 in that way and so on. Um, and that's sort of a showing what I would say is kind of the crux of the problem, right? The, the is ought uh, uh, gap that Hume talks about, which is what you're challenging here, really has to do with whether you can get a moral conclusion from simply stating descriptive factual premises and mm -hmm. so on. And that's, that's the challenge, right? So um, it, it's interesting. You actually gave an example of something you said, well, here's something that I would agree is a fallacy, right? Going from war is something that's that's yeah. common and natural, therefore it's something. Uh, so you're you're agreeing that uh, there's something fallacious about some of these moves, yes. but it seems yeah. like you want to keep something yeah. something in play. Yeah. But I would say that actually, um, what you're doing there in the way that you made your your uh, examples of, of arguments, like in what you read now, uh, is something that that Hume would have accepted mm. uh, on the sense of um, you've already built in some moral premises there. Because the way the, the mm -hmm. argument works is to say, if you want to get a moral conclusion, you need to have at least one moral premise. Right? Mm -hmm. It's not that there aren't factual premises. And this I took it actually to be your main point, that, that science gives us some, some factual premises here that, that make a difference. And that's exactly right. But the, the naturalistic fallacy doesn't say that, that you can't have factual premises. Um, it says... You can't have only factual premises, oh, okay. right? All right? You have to yeah. have something that yeah. has an ought such that together with the is, you can get an ought in the conclusion. Okay? And I would say that the way that you make your argument is actually bringing in oughts uh, into your premises. Um, and so you're not actually uh, denying the naturalistic fallacy. Really, you're accepting it, but you're just building in some some um, interesting. Some Ought premises to begin with, yeah. and that's the right way to do it. Right? Okay. I think that's yeah. the way to do it. Uh, I think that this is a, a difference in kind. Uh, the thing about the B example is, even if that's so, it's always right to say, "But should it be so?" Right? Uh, even if you say war is natural, it's always right to say, "But should it be done?" Right? Or right. shouldn't it? Right. Um, right. Hume talks about right. There's nothing in in logic by itself that tells us that we shouldn't just prefer the destruction of the world to the, to the, oh, uh, right, the, the arming little of finger. my little finger. Right. right. So, so the point is that those factual things by themselves are not enough, but if you then bring in some, um, uh, normative, uh, premises, then you can together, uh, get a normative conclusion. So I think, I think it still stands. Uh, <laughs> okay. I think, I think it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just to come at it with a, a different example with um, uh, Bentham's famous little quip about animal suffering, that it, it isn't can they talk or can they think, but, but can they suffer? And, you know, Peter Singer's expanding circle is this, you know, something has been driving all of us to move in this direction of consideration of the suffering of sentient beings. And we've expanded that circle to include more and more people into that. So I guess the, the question, the, the scientific observation that creatures that have brains that generate pain and suffering, um, I, I guess that's a factual observation. Why ought we not to do that? That's the harder problem. Say, say something like the theist would say, you can't give us a scientific answer for why we ought not to cause people to suffer. The... the point there is you can't give a scientific answer, right? So 
what would be an experiment that you could do uh, to say, here's why people shouldn't suffer? But is it just a metaphysical, just uh, well, a moral assumption or metaphysical assumption that? So I think you give a rational, give a rational example, a, a rational answer to it, uh, but it's not going to be a scientific answer. It's not something you do an experiment to determine. It's something that you give rational, ethical arguments for. Yeah. Right? So I don't think this has anything to do with with. I mean, you were making the contrast to metaphysics and the divine command theory. Right? It's it's wrong because God said so. That's right. not what ethicists would say. Right. But they would say you use reason to uh, figure out what's moral. But that's not something you do an experiment on. Right. Now, right. once you have a moral premise, it could be that you do an experiment to say, well, what is it that applies in this case? And science can help you answer those sorts of things. But it still requires that you have a moral premise to to get going. And I think that's what, you know, we use reason to do that. That's what ethics is about. Yeah, Pinker makes the point in Enlightenment now that when, when he talks about, you know, using science to solve these problems, he doesn't mean you go to the ichthyologist to ask about abortion rights. You know, the entire body of human knowledge that's been accumulated over thousands of years, including philosophy, all the philosophies, the humanities, and the sciences and so on is is kind of what we turn to unless you turn to God or or, or whatever. You actually have. I just wanted to to, to g- give you a, an opportunity to make a few comments about the humanities. You do have a discussion about that uh, and the role of the humanities and and in the other social sciences related to science in general. Yeah, part of part of what I think we need to work on is uh, recognizing that there needs to be some. Uh, coming together of folks on the science side and the humanities side. This is an old issue, uh, you know, the yes. gap between cultures right. and so on. Um, uh, it's not as though there are really only two cultures. There are plenty of different cultures. But it's certainly the case that uh, the sciences and the humanities really does kind of look at things in different ways. But it seems to me as though many of the, you know, the wicked social problems that we are facing now are ones that are going to require that both uh, – come into play. Uh, but it's going to require that each really comes to understand and appreciate what the other brings to the table. Uh, and unfortunately, part of what I think has happened is that at least for certain elements of the humanities, it's taken an anti-science view, which mm-hmm. winds up um, dismissing that. It, it, it's a little bit uh, uh, imperialistic because essentially what they want to do is bring science under their own uh, mm-hmm. narrative way of thinking about it. Um, but unfortunately, that that undermines what I think is is actually what's special about science is that it can provide us reason for uh, answering a way for answering questions about the empirical world that you need in order to solve some of these problems. Again, science isn't going to tell us always what to do, but it can tell us if you do this, this is what's going to happen. Or if you don't do that, that's what's going to happen. And then you should think through morally, ethically, politically socially and so on. What ought we do from among the various options? And you surely want to have some evidence to say um, that we're not going to do things that will go against what we're trying to achieve, right? And that's hopefully what science can do. Yeah, at the, toward the uh, end of your your last combined. chapter, you, you, you have this little section, liberty, liberty-freedom versus truth. Oh, liberty-freedom versus truth. But you, you hung a question mark there. Uh, so because, comment on because that. Because the way people talk about this, it makes it seem as though these things are in conflict. And it seems to me as though that's exactly the wrong way to, to think about it. Uh, uh, I also have a similar thing for uh, truth and equality, right? Mm. So so my uh, my uh, slogan at the end is is liberty, equality, reality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we got to have reality up. in there. I love that. <laughs> no, that's great. I, I, I do think that one of the problems that's been driving me crazy about, like, say, these gender war uh, gender wars have been going on like it, it has to turn out so, the science has to turn out to show that homosexuality is genetic or something because if it doesn't then we're worried that people are going to mistreat it doesn't matter what the science comes out we're committed to civil rights and equal treatment under the law and 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 universal human rights we're already committed to that regardless of what the scientific experiment turns out to be so this relates to the what we just had about uh, the yeah. is ought, right? So what if biology tells us one thing or another, right? It's like the bees example, right? Um, it's interesting to know, right? Maybe there's a genetic basis, maybe there's not, but independently of that, you can still say, 
hey, it's wrong to do certain kinds of, of things against someone to cause suffering or to uh, uh, have policies that are unjust or to have discrimination and so on. That's the sort of thing that's a moral argument that you can make independently of whether there's some uh, biological fact of the matter about uh, about genetics and so on. Yeah. Uh, and that's important to know. I mean, that's something that humanities brings to the table, right? We can have moral arguments about why it is that uh, these are important uh uh, moral principles to follow. Yeah. Okay, Robert, great book, really good, really deep stuff. It took you a long time to to to, uh, to write this. What's next on your uh, agenda? Uh, uh, the the next the next one in process now is is on some of the digital evolution work that we've been doing. Uh, oh, using right, right. Using digital organisms and and how you can essentially harness uh, evolution. Uh, in a computer environment, uh, and then uh, use it for experimentation, but also for uh, for practical purposes too. It's some of the research that we've been doing here, uh, uh, using those sorts of models. By the way, are are you worried about AI? Are you uh, worried about the robo apocalypse coming? <laughs> <laughs> Let's make sure that we build in some ethics. Uh, well, yes, right. That's, that's right. That's actually one of the the things I wanted to talk about because I think it is something where, as you are um, building things, right? I'm talking about our discussion today has been about the scientific virtues, but I'm also thinking about the engineering virtues, yeah. right? Uh, part of what an engineer wants to do is build things. And it seems to me that one of those things you ought to be paying attention to is what are the values we're building in? Uh, and if we're building AI, we better be thinking about the values that that AI is going to have, because uh, that will make a big difference potentially. So how do you answer the question, the self-driving car is about to mow down the five people on the sidewalk or the three in the crosswalk and, and it has three passengers in the back seat and, and you know sort of the trolley problem the trolley problem. this is something that had been just esoteric philosophy for ages <laughs> and suddenly there's a <laughs> real example <laughs> I know. so don't discount that philosophy let me tell you <laughs> totally i mean so your lab's been, been been thinking about that absolutely this is something where uh, we actually have a, an autonomous vehicle initiative here on campus uh and it, it's something where you can't begin to think about building these sorts of systems, uh, I would say, without thinking about the values that are involved in that, because you're building in values as you do it. Yeah. Yeah, I drive a Tesla. So if uh, the example I use about runaway AI is that, you know, when I press the little button, I say navigate LAX, and it, it des designs the fastest route to get me there based on LA traffic, which is always terrible. But 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 if it's not going to like leap up on the sidewalk, plow through pedestrians to go around some traffic in the in the lane. And if it did that, it would only do it once before the federal government came in and regulated Tesla to not let the programmers do that kind of thing. So to me, it seems like we'll have plenty of time between now and whatever the doomsday is going to be with AGI to program in all those kinds of ethical checks and balances, whatever the right answer is going to be for the more tricky examples. Yeah, the point is, uh, we ought to make that explicitly part of what we're what we're doing, right? To recognize that that's part of what design is all about. Uh, it's building in values. Yeah. Well, that should be your next. That should be your next uh, project. A a it's coming up. And, and get yourself a self driving car. <laughs> I don't know. I have to tell you, I like driving. Uh, I'm of that. Uh, I'm about the same age as you. I like driving cars. Uh, I'm not that excited about having self-driving. It's only great on LA freeways where you, you double click and the steering takes over, which is nice on a, on a crowded freeway. But, you know, on surface streets and stuff, I actually like driving. And I have a three, I now have a three-year-old son. I got, got remarried and we had a little boy. And I got to thinking the other day, he may never drive a car. You know, in another 10, 15 years when he's supposed to get his, well, about 15 years, supposed to get his driver's license, there may not be, uh, you know, regular cars anymore. Or we may be in the middle of the transition. Well, my, my daughter is now 17, and, and I insisted that when she got her driver's license that she learned to use a stick shift. Oh, my uh, God. Stick shift? Are too, That's are almost unheard of. Around anymore. Oh, my God. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, there's some reasons for being able to do these things. Uh, and, you know, now that she's done it, I think she realizes, all right, well, I guess that was okay. <laughs> <laughs> she could drive cars that no one else can in her in her cohort. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she'll be able to escape from Jurassic Park uh, in, right. uh, in the way that others can't in, that, in the Jeep. Uh, but I mean, if you so think, I, the same you, thing is going to be true for, for uh, yeah. this next transition. 
Uh, it's good if we still learn to drive. We can't trust it entirely to the AI. I think so. I think so. Although I, I suppose in 50 years, it could be like you would go to a private racetrack or some kind of track to drive an internal combustion car that sounds loud and it has a stick shift and that becomes a form of recreation. <laughs> <laughs> that would be crazy. And, exactly. in the, and if you think about like the long 10,000 year history of civilization, you know, the internal combustion engine, fossil fuels and automobile self-driving uh, human driven automobiles, that'll just be like a 150 year little window. Uh, and, and we'll be, you know, all the time before that. And then the time after that, that would be weird. So my general view on, on this is for engineering, right, that there are uh, virtues that should go along with that as well, uh, and that responsibilities come with that. And this mm. is going to be one of those things. It's, it's pretty obvious in the self-driving car case, but I would say this is true of uh, any sort of engineering that we do, uh, that values are part of the design process, and we ought to be making that explicit. Yep. All right. Sounds good. That sounds good, Robert. Thanks for coming on the show. Congratulations again on the book, An Instinct for Truth, Curiosity, and the Moral Character of Science. What a great title. Cool. Thanks a lot for having me. I appreciate it.